y'all doing all right, Marty? Doing good. Are you Thank sure? You Praise Amen. Lord. Good deal. Hey, Terry, you all right? Good. How's everybody else doing? Good, good deal, good deal. Thank you, David and Nathan up there in the top. There's Carrie taking care of the computer, and Glenn's making sure everybody's in check, right? That's good. Good to see y'all uh, tonight. Appreciate you being here. Uh, if you want to open your Bible, we're going to look at some in Genesis chapter 1 in just a little bit. Uh, but while we're getting ready, uh, I want to take some time for prayer requests and uh, just get caught up on uh, what's uh, new and what's ahead of us and the good things we're looking forward to coming up this weekend and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, we want to certainly take some time for our prayer requests because that's very important. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about intimacy with God tonight because I believe if there's ever been a time that it's very difficult for people to spend meaningful time with God, it's the fast-paced world we live in now. And so we're going to talk about some of that, and I hope will be helpful to you. Uh, in way of prayer request tonight, I want to mention a few just that I am uh, aware of and just a few things coming up, especially this weekend. Uh, I want to encourage you about Sunday that you'd be in your place here for Sunday school and worship at 9 and 10. Uh, we have our mission team will be reporting back to us and you'll hear some testimonies and see some slideshows and all sorts of neat and interesting stuff that I trust will be a blessing to you. Uh, so do be here for that. We'll have baptism for Brother Howard on Sunday as well, and he's very excited about what the Lord's doing in his life, and I know we are too, so pray much for Sunday. If your Alabama Baptist came today, you'll notice there was a familiar faces on the front page. Did anybody get it today? Good. All your other, hey, look here, it's all right. I used to tell the folks in Georgia they'd always kid me about being an hour behind and how we was a little more than an hour behind and all that kind of stuff. And I would just tell them we lived so far back you didn't get the Grand Ole Opry to Wednesday. And they, uh, so some of you get the Alabama Baptist another day late. Right? But anyhow, you'll notice the article with David and his family and uh, the story of the journey that they've been on all his life. And that's a long time now, right? And we're grateful to God for that and, and uh, the story of how they have dealt with... Uh, uh, cystic fibrosis and then the changes and thank God the advancements and treatment and things that have even came along in recent years that have really helped them personally and as a family. Uh, Grace Thornton did the article. Isn't she a wonderful young lady? I mean, she's done several articles for us here. She is called and uh, one was, of course, about our Utah partnership and then a follow-up about that. And then, of course, she called me when she did the article with Nathan and and uh, how he, uh, you know, took responsibility on uh, helping fund his uh, his uh, mission trip to Utah and all that kind of good stuff. I knew he made so much money on those drawings. I stayed real close to him every time we went to the ice cream shop because I thought, you know, Nate, I'm, I'm his pastor. He's going to take care of him. No, I'm kidding. I didn't do that at all. I just like to cut him. Nate's great. He did a wonderful job on the mission trip. He's a great crew leader. And so I did talk with Grace several times. I... I and she just did a wonderful job writing. She's a very sweet person and just uh, does a great, all of those folks at the Alabama Baptist do a good job and we're grateful for them. So if you had time to read the article, I know you will uh, when you do. And then if you get yours tomorrow, uh, then you uh, read that and I think you will uh, be blessed. And I know I was and I'm just thankful to see that. I just remember as I told Grace, she asked me what all I knew about, and she didn't put any of this in the article so I'm upset, right? But uh, she wanted to know what all I knew about David Cobb and I said, honey, how long you got? And uh, and so she, I just told her the honest, I was cutting up. I said, uh, actually I met David, he's an 11 year old boy and I was his 17 year old summer baseball coach and that's how we became friends and been friends ever since and uh, I remember that uh, uh, even as an 11-year-old boy dealing with that, uh, they made, his parents made very clear to me, we want him to do what the other kids can do if at all possible. So, hey, I, David, best I remember, you ran every base and every pole to pole. And I tried to get you all ready for varsity sports at 11 because I didn't want you all to be shocked what it was going to be like. Uh, pole to poles, you know, little guys don't do that, but those guys did, and they did a great job. And we did win the championship, just as a side note, because of uh, all those pole to poles, right? But nevertheless, I think that'll be a great blessing to you to read that article 
far as prayer requests, I know most of you are aware. If not, uh, please pray for Miss Gail Donaldson's family. Miss Gail went home to be with the Lord last night uh, and uh, was with her family yesterday and again last night and, uh, you know, and way late. But nevertheless, um, they are doing as well as can be. Had a long journey. Anybody that's gone through that, losing a family member to dementia and Alzheimer's, you, you know the journey. It's very taxing. It's very, uh, it, it drains you physically, mentally spiritually, psychologically, and all those fancy long words, but it, but anyhow, pray for their family. The visitation is noon Friday here at the church, uh, and also the funeral service will follow at 2 o'clock. Uh, talk with them. Uh, their, daughter's, uh, fa- their daughter's Sunday school class at their church is providing a meal for them, so we uh, won't have to do that. Of course, we're always willing, and I appreciate y'all so much for what you do to families when in need. So let's reach out to them and love on them and help them through this hard time. Uh, Miss Connie uh, texted with me some yesterday, wanted me to remember her brother Donnie, Donnie Lipscomb, and her sister Jane. Both of them are still experiencing some very serious health issues. And, of course, she was very concerned about them, upset, wanted us to make sure we mentioned them tonight and remember them. Our prayers uh, do pray for, you know, Brother John and Miss Ann and all of our residents at the nursing home, Patsy and and Mr. Horace, and just we know that COVID is beginning to be an issue again. So pray that it doesn't become an issue for families to be able to visit with their loved ones. I, I know what that's like, and you do too. So we're praying that that doesn't. But pray for their all their health, the health of the staff that cares for them and pray that it doesn't begin to affect families being able to visit with their loved ones. Uh, Several of our families are on vacation this week, and several of them have asked us to remember in their prayers. So do remember our church families on vacation. Our students are meeting tonight at the Miller's uh, home, so uh, them and a lot of our leaders are there. So do pray for them and as they have an off-campus event there tonight. Y'all share with me other requests that you have tonight, someone. Yes, yes, Carly, go ahead. Yes. Mm. I do remember Carla, one of Carla's best friends, uh, Miss Mrs. Sharp, uh, dealing with pleurisy and needs our prayers. Thank you. Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah, this Friday, if you have Hulu, or have access to Hulu. I thought when they talked to me about Hulu, I thought they were talking about one of them Hulu hoops or something, or Tubi and all these different fire stick deals. My daughter bought me one for Christmas, and I began to learn how to use it. It's pretty awesome. I did watch the seven-part series Under the Banner of Heaven. It's on Hulu about uh, one of the books we got from Sandra Tanner's about the Mormon murders of 1984. It's very interesting, very interesting. I recommend that to you. Uh, But um, Dixie and Shane, all of you, if you don't know them, you will see them again. Fifth and sixth generation Mormons shared their testimony here in 2019 of their journey to grace. And God has opened a door for them to do a video series that literally helps those who are bound in the depths of Mormonism understand the good grace of God and the salvation through Jesus Christ and him alone. So that's becoming available Friday on Hulu. Is it six parts? Seven. And all seven will be available, so I would encourage you to, what's that? Six or seven, how about that? Half a dozen. Right to slcministries.org. Thank you, Glenn. And we can clear up where it's at. If somebody figures that out before the end tonight, just share. Go right ahead, Carrie. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. But we will let you know where that is. But it is a uh, it is a video series that helps people understand a journey to grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. Here's the big thing. It's going to really open them up. To a lot of attacks, so we need to pray for them. Yes, Miss Sheila. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's 
So Miss uh, Sheila's friend, Teresa Thomas, is in ICU at Grandview, began with an infection, in which now they realize she has COVID, so she definitely needs our prayers. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, Wanda, Ed, Wanda Edwards, Clara's cousins in Grady uh, in Atlanta. So I do remember her. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Brenda. Donna Rowe. Yeah. Thank you. Miss Camille, she's home, but uh, still recovering from that uh, broken ankle after rehab, so do pray for her, okay? Anyone else? Uh, just a couple here. A Angie has, uh, as you know, she grew up in Texas until we were in 11th grade, and she had a very close friend that just lived across the alley from her in a little small town where they grew up there in North Texas uh, that she found out passed away yesterday of a blood clot, 51 years old. So uh, do pray uh, for the Boren family, B-O-R-E-N, Boren family out in Texas and you say I don't have a clue who they are with Jesus does uh, so do remember them uh, and also when I served in Waco Baptist Church we had a family had a little girl born while we were there with that little girl's grown now and she was injured in the accident that you probably heard about at the Tallapoosa exit where the gas line exploded and the barbecue place of smoking pig there she was one of the workers there and, and she was injured in that and she also I do believe it's at Grady, but I know she is in a burn unit there in uh, Atlanta. And she's a beautiful young lady, probably 20 years old, maybe, and um, just just precious. Her name is Savannah House, and so pray for her. I know that her family would appreciate you doing that very much. All righty. Anybody? Yes, sir. Yes, Don. Thank you. Dot's brother Travis is uh, having a chemo uh, for cancer, so do remember Dot. Goodness gracious. Well, I appreciate you telling me. Well, let's pray for these needs right here, and then we'll look to God's word tonight for some strength and encouragement and, uh, and just trust that the Lord has a word for us. Let's pray. God, we love you tonight, and we thank you for first loving us. And God, I just want to lift up all these requests. And Lord, we, we don't take lightly this time that we spend each Wednesday because, God, the reason we open our hearts and minds and our eyes and ears to these requests is because every person who asks and requests prayer does so because this person or this situation means a whole lot to them. God, we join them in that because, Lord, even though we may not know these people personally, even though we, we may not know all about the situation or circumstances, God, they do and you do. And God, we just lift them up to you tonight. And God, where there's been loss of loved ones, or we just know that there's a void only you can fill. Where there is sickness, we know, Father, that only you can bring healing to their body and God you do that through medicine you do that through treatment you do that through so many ways but it comes from you and, and Lord we're theirs all sorts of circumstances that are beyond our control or anyone else's only you can bring any sense to the chaos Lord we lift them up to you and we ask you to do great works in their lives our friends, Father, who are stepping out and so committed to the gospel that they know that by producing the video teaching on a journey to grace, that helps lead people out of the bondage of Mormonism, things of that nature, even though that it may cause them great difficulty. They're willing to because they believe that you are the only way to heaven and that you are the answer. God, we pray for their protection. We pray 
for their faithfulness. We pray for their spiritual endurance and their personal integrity during this time. And God, we pray that we would be prayer support and support in any way that would help them fulfill the mission which they're on. Because God, we're on that mission too. We're not just sideline cheerleaders. We're, we're not just say, go, go, get them, get them. Lord, we're in the game. We're, we're in the trenches. And we believe, God, you have all the answers. Lord, help us to be faithful in these dark times. Help us to remain true to the call that you've placed on all of our lives. May the Son of God be glorified through all we do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Carrie, did you get that? So do remember, we did find that. You can go to slcministries.org or journeyofgrace.com to view those videos and hopefully to get to YouTube. Hopefully it stays there. We don't know, but that's where it is. I think I got under the banner of grace mixed up on the Hulu deal because I did watch that on Hulu So and I was reading the book too. So anyhow, uh, do pray much for that. and It'll be some wonderful stuff for you and hopefully... In the coming days, we'll use that material and we'll use some other materials that we got in our trip to Miss Sandra Tanner's house, some video and things like that to be able to put in the hands of our people as we send more and more teams into that area. Because the more we go, you realize the more invested you get, the harder the warfare is going to be, don't you? I mean, you, you know, you... It's just like in a swimming pool. You put your feet, it can, water can be cold. You can put your feet in, you can kind of stand it a little bit. But when you go all in, it, 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 you're all in. So just remember that. It's a big difference between dipping your toe and diving in. So we're in the warfare too. And every time we go, uh, you know, I, I know the enemy knows we're more and more serious about it. So uh, that's what I think. It'll do us really good to have that information. To, put in front of our folks in the days ahead, okay? Hey, I was doing, a, I've been doing something in my quiet time, and uh, I want to, I always encourage you to do that. I've been writing in my journal on these things because if I don't do these things, I don't know about you, but my my spiritual journey can, can get dry just like anybody else. I mean, you can find yourself slipping into a rut, but when you're documenting your journey and you're staying on task and you're not just checking off a box but you're really seeking God because here's the deal it's just like when you give prayer requests you, you do so because that person or that situation matters to you when you lift your hand and say pray for my friend pray for my family member or pray for this situation it's because those things really matter to you and that's so true with your quiet time with God it's, it's got to really matter to you so I was reading through, uh, years ago I read this book called Life Principles by Charles Stanley. Anybody ever read that book? Bobby, you read it? Okay, you know where I'm at then, okay? And, and it, it, I read through it years ago, and I think part of my reading was because I think it was a required book to read, but I am a person who emphasizes, and y'all hear me emphasize this quite a bit, Principles and purpose are far more important than our preferences, right? I had someone text me this week, say, hey, you know that, that, that quote you gave Sunday that you signed your name to, what was that? <laughs> oh, there, once again, I don't have any credit for originality, but I was just saying to our church, and I sent back to my friend, I said, the quote was simply this, you know, focusing on our preferences will divide us, but understanding our purpose will unite us. So I'm more focused on purpose and principles than I am preferences, and I think that's very important. If I'm going to be a leader of God's people, I can't be focused on preference because we've all got different ones. We've got things we like. Some people, uh, I've been trying to make myself like black coffee. Does anybody else drink black coffee? Okay, anybody? Right, well, prayer. Would y'all please pray for Jim and pray for Glenn. Pray for them. Y'all don't know what y'all missing. 
you put you some cream in that, that stuff's drinkable, right? All right? But I've been trying to make myself like black coffee. And you know what? I hadn't got there yet. I really don't. I mean, they make these wonderful things. The best, the best cream you can put in coffee under, the, under heaven, and trust me, I've tried them all, is this stuff called, it comes from, uh, <laughs> it's sweet cream from the Cold Stone Creamery. Y'all seen that? They make a coffee creamery. Marty, y'all try it. I mean, it, it might put some more hair. I, I don't know, but anyhow, but this sweet cream creamer, and, and, and you know what bad is, is I really like my coffee with that sweet cream creamer, but black, it just tastes like, you know, I'm drinking a quart of motor oil or something. I don't know, but any, anyhow, I, I'm, I'm trying. So my preference is I don't really prefer black coffee. But if you prefer black coffee, does that mean that you're right about coffee and I'm wrong or I'm right and you're wrong? No, that's really just all about a preference. I mean, some people like it different ways. I have a friend that I've uh, been known for years, and he worked Delta Airlines, and he worked the night shift and did maintenance and all that on airplanes. And he'd tell me when we'd get a cup of coffee at church, he'd say, Preacher, you know how to mess up a real good cup of coffee by putting cream in it. I'm like... But I'm getting it where I can stand to swallow it. But anyhow, he, uh, he really liked black coffee. That was his preference. When we talk about those things, it's important, but our preferences should never determine our priority. But for a lot of folks, it does. What we prefer to do determines what we make important instead of letting what is important determine and guide our preferences. So Charles Stanley, in this book years ago, and I began reading it some of my quiet time, and it's really, it's spoken to me this time, Bobby, more than the last time, because I'm not reading it as an assignment. You know, it's kind of like, uh, since Sonia ain't here, I can say this stuff. Uh, a, t- a Tale of Two Cities, or The Telltale Heart, or, uh, or, or Macbeth, or Shakespeare, really didn't crank my tractor. You know, really, eh, just honest. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't really read it. I, I, I didn't read it. I, I don't know how I got through high school. I did not read. I'm just telling you, I, I just did. I could not. It was like painful to sit there and read this boring stuff, okay? Right? All right? So that was an assignment. Now, uh, and that wasn't the teacher's fault because the teacher was required to give you these assignments based on what the state uh what is it my, my daughter tells me all the time? Standards, that's the word. You got to teach the standards, isn't it? So that was one of the standards. You had to read these books. And I, I was just, but now in reading, uh, I've learned to enjoy it more because I realize that reading really enhances my relationship with the one I'm reading about. It's not just a bland, boring book about somebody you know and their heart beating under the bed. And you, How do you even know that from the telltale heart? Somebody told me. I didn't read it. But yeah, I'm just saying it was just that. But so when I began to read um, um, uh, the life principles again, and I realized too during that study I had a copy of Charles Stanley's Life Principles Bible, and I just began to really absorb and enjoy what he was saying because one thing Dr. Stanley has done and has committed and taught the body of Christ is is that you have to put down some principles that you're going to live your life by because if you don't and they're not shaped by scripture and they're not viewed through the lens of scripture then you'll just be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes along and you'll never know where you are or where you stand on anything and the first one that he talks about in the very first chapter of his book is life principle number one. And here's what he says. He says, Our intimacy with Christ, which is his highest priority for our lives, determines the impact of our lives. Now, some people think impact is determined by giftedness or charisma or things like that, but that's really not true because impact is not just that initial blow. It's the ripples that continues from on down the road. So impact is determined and your intimacy with Christ has everything to do with your long-term impact because it is his highest priority. It's his priority. What is the priority of God the Father? His highest priority is that he would have direct and close intimate relationship with his children. 
I, I know when my kids were growing up, I was that way. Now that they're grown, I still, I love to hear from my kids. It's second to hearing from heaven. That's where I enjoy when the, my phone rings and, you know, my phone rings and it's Caitlin. I'm not too worried. And it's Brooklyn. I'm like, oh, something's up because she don't call me as much. But anyhow, she she's getting better. But uh, anyhow, um, she still needs prayer in that department, right? But uh, that's what matters to God. And here's what I have to ask myself. If that's the highest priority of my Heavenly Father, of my intimate relationship with Him, then it ought to be the highest priority of my life, right? It shouldn't be that I come up with anything else. So I wanted to share a few things we and some things that I had put together that I just feel really help us because... If there's one thing I can help you with above anything else is if I can help you to fall in love with Jesus and communicate intimately and, and, and not and regularly and all that with God, then I can help you walk with God. Because here's my, my real priority as a pastor is that I would help you walk with God. Because there's a lot of time in between Sunday and Wednesday. I mean, we Sunday morning, 11.30, till Wednesday at 6 o'clock, till next Sunday at 9 o'clock when you meet with your Sunday school teacher. You know, there's a lot of hours in between that. And you know what? This world is screaming for your attention. Whether it's an advertisement, whether it's a political agenda, well, no matter what it is, this world is screaming for your attention. So with that being said, let me just mention a couple of things that I learned from Dr. Stanley and from some others that I believe will help you in this situation. He said this, he said, God created human beings with fellowship in mind. Think about this for a minute. He created human beings. He didn't just create us so he'd have some problems to deal with. He created us with fellowship in mind, first with himself and then with others. He wants you to have good relationship, fellowship with others. But we cannot fully love one another until we have ourselves experienced the love of God. I believe that is so true because when we experience the love of God, it opens a whole new realm of intimacy with, uh, with God and with others. See, we experience his love when we willingly surrender to his call to be our Savior, Lord, and friend. I remember this guy one time we'd sing the chorus, you know, I, I am a friend of God. And I remember this guy just thought it was horrible. He goes, I don't like nobody calling Bible does. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you can get upset about it, but really, he, he created us to have relationship with him. So he says there's at least three reasons God seeks our surrender. Here's one. One is he loves us and desires our fellowship and worship. When we worship God, I think it's something that has really spoken to me over the years, is when we worship God, it's not, it's not just about gathering, even though that's important. It's not just about singing, even though that's important. It's not just about the prayers, even though that's important. It's not just about the preaching, even though that's important. When we come together to worship God, it's about us meeting with God, and it's about us exalting God. It's about us glorifying God through the music, through the praying, through the preaching, that everything would be focused on exalting Him. I really believe that, and that's something we can't miss. And He says another thing. He says... Not only is, should um, God seeks our surrender because he loves us and desires our fellowship and worship, but he wants our service for him to be effective and fruitful. I love John chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. I think of my, some of my favorite chapters, you know, John 15, Romans 5, Romans 8. And I think about different, you know, chapters in Scripture that just really, really speak to our soul. But when he talks in John 15, he talks about bearing fruit, doesn't he? But he makes sure we know this. He is the true vine. And if we're not attached to the true vine, then there's no way we can be fruitful or effective. But the progression of John 15 moves like this. He says, I am the true vine, and you abide in me that you might bear fruit, that you might bear more fruit, that you might bear much fruit. And in verse 16 he says that you would bear fruit that remains. When I look back over my ministry, uh, <laughs> there's times I get discouraged just like everybody else is thinking about because I, I know what it's like to 
go into a restaurant, sit down at a restaurant with my family and order dinner and look over at the bar and there's a guy who I had baptized, a guy I had who had been a Sunday school director in the church I served just drinking them back as fast as he can and he's already in no shape and then they somehow recognize me and I'm not going to avoid them Amen. I'm not going to be ugly to them I'm going to acknowledge them speak to them and all that kind of stuff but I sit there with a broken heart I know what it's like to go through all these things and I know what it's like to over the years and people that I have had the privilege to minister to and really felt a had the privilege to lead them to the Lord, baptize them and their families and now with social media they go to social media and they use terrible language and they share terrible ungodly things and it just breaks my heart. Some people say why don't you just tell them you know well I don't know that that's really going to help but I mean the fact of the matter is it's heartbreaking. I look at those things. You know what Satan will say? Some preacher you are. Look at these people. I mean, I know what it's like for people to come to me in every town I've ever served in. There's been people come to me and say, hey, I know so-and-so goes to your church, which is not my church, y'all know that. This is God's church. He just allows me the privilege to, 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 to lead him under his authority. I, I know my place. And, and they well, your church, and they were doing this, and they were doing that, and that. Some kind of preacher you must be. I'll never forget one day I went to New Orleans Seminary feeling lower in the snake's belly and old Gene Tyre, Dr. Gene Tyre. He told me at lunch one day, he said, how's it going, Brent? And I just shared a few things like that. Dad, this has been many years ago. And he said, son, he said, you're going to have to release yourself from the responsibility of holding yourself accountable for the way people behave when they leave the church. He said, it is not your responsibility. It is not your fault. You are not accountable for their behavior. That helped me, Marty. And I knew that I wasn't, but I felt responsible that there was something I needed to do to help them. Because I want you to know this. If somebody has a problem, I'm not here to push them further under the water. I'm there to get them out. I, I'm not there to hurt them. I'm there to help them. I'm not there. And even if we have to point out the error, the error is always pointed out with the intent to correct the behavior, repent, and get right with God. It's redemptive, right? So it's not my, but I remember all that. I know what it's like to have those moments with some preacher you are. Boy, if, if you was really a man of God, those people wouldn't act like that when they leave that church building. <laughs> so God's helped me with that. God wants us to be able to bear fruit and I want you to know there's so many things that, so much fruit that we can bear that we're probably not even aware of how God is using it, things like that and then you have days like Mr. Howard Park, you know you see a man who's moved in our community and wants it got right with God and wants to make sure everything's right, I mean hey, but those days remind you of what you do and sometimes when you see these kids and I pulled a folder out the other day and there's this little guy wrote me this card years ago and he colored it in different colors and now he's grown and he's a fireman and he's, uh, you know, has a career and everything else and he put on there and said, Preacher, keep preaching your heart out. Boy, I just, that, get, that reminds me of why we do what we do. He wants you to be fruitful and sometimes you don't always see the fruit. Sometimes you don't always see the effect but know that God is still working. Here's a third reason. He wants, excuse me, he waits for the freedom to bless us. Now listen to this. God is omnipotent, but will not violate his own principles. He draws us to himself so we can experience his love and forgiveness. He asks us for our willing surrender so that he can give us the best blessings he has to offer. Our waiting, here's the key words, waiting for our willing surrender. He doesn't want to force us into submission. He's waiting for us to willingly submit to his lordship. And he wants to give us his best. I'll never forget years ago here in Junior Hill preaching on this very subject about God's best. He said the problem with a lot of God's people is, is that we will pass up God's best for something that's just a little bit better because it's quicker and more convenient and we won't wait on God to do his best work because we just want to fix it. 
I don't know about y'all. Anybody been guilty besides me? <laughs> uh, maybe passing up God's best for just something a little better? Oh, golly, don't do that. So why do we resist? With all this in mind, why does anyone resist surrendering to God? I can't understand it. It breaks my heart every time we give a gospel invitation. Across this congregation on Sundays, there'll be people on the, on the front on the floor and people in the balcony and, and you oh many years as I've been doing this you can sense the power of God you can sense the conviction of God you can sense the drawing of God and people are content to just continue as is without fully surrendering to God and here's what we do when we don't willingly submit we restrain his ability to fully bless us wow so what is the key reason most people resist surrender I'll just tell you it's real simple you know it five letter word called pride you ever heard of that Pride is the key reason most people resist surrender. <clears throat> Here's what people do. They think they know better than God. <laughs> you know when you're growing up and your parents told you to do something or not do something and you thought you might know a little better than them? I know none of y'all ever did that. I, I was the only one that made mistakes like that. But you couldn't understand why. And then you got down the road and you became a parent. And you begin to tell your children things to do and things not to do, places to go, places to stay away from, and they didn't fully understand. And you know why? They didn't understand. The same reason you didn't understand. You needed a parent. They needed a parent. You needed direction. They needed direction. It was your turn to be the child. You got the direction. And your turn to be a parent. You give the direction. Then you become grandparents, and you give no direction. Just whatever you want to do, sweetheart, right? <laughs> Oh, man, everybody tells me my time's coming on that. But nevertheless, that's what happened. We think we know better than God, and we think we can handle life better than God can. So it's very easy for us to try to keep him at arm's distance. Well, there was something that I read, too, along these lines. Talk about what it means to sit before the Lord. You remember in John chapter 12 when Mary and Martha were kind of at odds and Martha was working like crazy and Mary was just sitting over with Jesus, you know. And Martha was like, you know, I'm doing a lot of work. Jesus, you need to, you need to scold her. And uh, he says, uh, Martha, she, she's chosen the better part. She sat at his feet. And what does it mean to sit before the Lord? And you know, this is one of the things that I don't know if you ever struggle with. But I know it's a struggle for me because just pers personality-wise and how I'm wired up, I'm an action-oriented person. I, I'm not a person who lays around a lot or anything like that, so I'm, I'm not good at sitting before the Lord, but I've tried to get better. And I've read some things about that based on what happened with David in 2 Samuel. He says, perhaps the greatest key to spiritual growth is spending time alone with the Lord. This means taking the time to speak with God about whatever's on your heart and even more importantly, allowing him to speak to you. There's a lot of bad things came out of this pandemic that we've been through and still going to deal with, endemic, whatever they call it now. But I'll tell you one of the best things that came out of that for me. You know what it forced me to do? It forced me to get still some and let God speak to me. You know, and here's another reason. Out of necessity, I cry out to God and say, God, I don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't know if anybody else does. But I know one thing's for sure. Without your wisdom, we can't lead people through this most difficult time. It forced me to get still. And that's where, you know, me and Mo became such good buddies because we, we were together a lot. We couldn't really go anywhere. Everything was closed. We, you know, nine weeks straight, we did church online, and then we did all these different things. And, and between the Lord and Mo, there was a great comfort to my soul because I learned some of these principles that David learned. See, King David has been called a man after God's own heart, and to win that kind of reputation, David first needed to know the mind and heart of God so that he might be and do what the Lord desired of him. Well, that's something else. Now look here. So what did it mean in 2 Samuel 7, 18? Here's what the Bible says. King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? So what did it mean for David to sit before the Lord? Let me give you this tonight. 
It means that he spent time alone in the presence of God. Communicating with the Lord from the depths of his heart. Asking questions of God and listening quietly before the Lord for the Lord's answers. I remember in the earliest days of the pandemic when everything was shutting down. I remember when the school buses ran for the last time that school year. And I remember standing in this sanctuary one evening when it was dreary and rainy outside. And I remember standing there and I'd sit and pray and I'd talk to God and I, I did my best to listen, but my mind was just kind of like yours was probably going 100 miles an hour. Every day, you know, they had those coronavirus press conferences that went on forever and ever and you were just trying to hopefully get something from that that would help you and God really helped me through those times I remember Marty very clearly during those times I'd be here praying and because it was just me and Jesus it was alright for me just to bust out and sing a little bit right? Amen. and I just began to sing those choruses Holy Spirit rain down and my favorite one is you know, you know Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me I mean I've sung that in this worship center by myself probably a hundred times in the last few years because I know that unless he, unless he puts it in his hands, unless he blesses it, unless his anointing is on us, then there's nothing we can do of any lasting impact. But I remember walking through this worship center, you know, touching pews and saying, God, I don't know when anybody's ever going to be able to sit here again, but whenever they are and whoever it is, God, I pray that they'd have a fresh encounter with you and that worship would be real and that they would experience what it means to be in the presence of God because one of the part of that chorus is, Lord, we need a fresh anointing. We can't borrow from yesterday. So many Christian people, so many churches are still focused on what God did back then instead of what God is going to do tomorrow. I talked to a pastor this week. I said, too many, too many of us are too worried about the maintenance of the aquarium instead of mobilizing people to go fish for men. <laughs> I said, I mean, we're worried about making sure everybody's okay and all that kind of stuff instead of making sure that we're mobilizing the church. So there's a hard balance there. But when we borrow from yesterday, and we don't get a fresh anointing for today that will get us to tomorrow. We certainly can't accomplish God's full will for our life. I'll share with you something Bill Stafford said, and I'm done. Old Bill Stafford was quite a preacher in his time, pastored uh, the Lupton Drive Baptist Church up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, traveled the country and the world. And I tell you, if you know anybody that has a prodigal son or daughter, there's a book he wrote about his son, Bill Stafford III, that I recommend to you, and I'd have to look at the title of it, but I read it, and I've recommended it to many, and it has been a great help because his son was not just walked away from God. He was sprinting away, wide open away from God. And um, <clears throat> Bill talked about what he went through and pastoring and all that and with his son and talked about the night that his son came home to Jesus and Bill Stafford III ultimately was the president of the International Congress on Revival. What a transformation God did in his life. He's still preaching today. Bill, his daddy's with Jesus. But Bill said this. He said, Jesus did not come to this world to improve you. He said, there's nothing there to improve. <laughs> he said, the character of the Lord is not formed in us by improving our self life the character of the Lord is revealed in us by releasing the Christ life we, look, we don't have anything to offer God we, just, you know, we don't have anything to offer him or that he can improve he didn't come to reform us he came to transform us and what he is saying here is if we're going to do what God wants us to do the character of the Lord is only revealed when we live the Christ life. And the way we live the Christ life is by having a good, intimate relationship with Him. Now let me say this and I'm done. It's not going to be easy to accomplish that task. Why? Because we have so much competing for our attention. I have found out in, 
if I don't get a jump on it early, the day gets started <laughs> and it'll spin out of control. Anybody ever had those kind of days? You know what I'm talking about. You want to get a jump on it early, I'm able to see and able to hear more clearly. Years ago, I used to be bad about and, you know, just and get up and, you know, and the TV would come on and the news would be on and that really was not a good way to start. I, I'd give that later, right? I'd give that later. You know, I used to do it for weather or whatever, but, you know, you can turn on your phone now and get a weather report without listening to any of that garbage, right? But nevertheless, here's the deal. If God's highest priority is to have close, intimate relationship with me, then I ought to have the same priority of having a close, intimate relationship with him. And you know what? If there's one failure, and Lord knows I have many, and I'll just help you, so do you, amen? We all have many. If there's one failure that I've struggled with, and I bet many others have, it's making sure that that is my top priority. You remember when Jesus, in Mark chapter 1, was with his disciples? And while they were all asleep, he got up early, and he made a priority to go spend time with the Father. You remember that? The disciples woke up and went, Hey, what are you doing? We're supposed to... But he did not allow them to dictate his priority. He allowed his relationship with the Father to dictate his priority. Can I say this to you tonight? If you allow the Father to dictate your priorities, you'll never go wrong. If you allow me or people, anybody else... You can get sideways. But when he directs your priority, you'll always, always be right with him. And I believe that's the goal for all of us. Amen? Pray with me. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your precious and holy word. And we thank you for the words that we have read this week and words we've just shared here, God, from your word and from the writings and teachings of some of your greatest servants. Father, I pray right now for every person in this room, those who will watch online now or the recording. God, I pray for their relationship with you and their communication with you. God, it has been a struggle for me my entire Christian life, especially in my ministry and pastoral life. Because God, it's so hard to balance everything. It's so hard to be everywhere you need to be and take care of everything you need to take care of and minister to every situation that requires attention. And Lord, as important as those things are, if we're not careful, our communication with you will suffer. And when our intimacy with you suffers, it really affects us in ways that we don't even realize sometimes. It affects us in our witnessing because we're not as prepared and ready to share the gospel. It affects us in our relationships with others because our relationship with you is so foundational. And God, because of that, I just pray, Lord, you just help us in this hour. Help us, God, to focus on the health of that relationship with you. Help us, God, to not get so caught up in everything that's going on in the world that we miss your best for some things that are just a little better. Help us to remember as we learn tonight, Father, that the Christ life revealed in us is what it's all about. And when we're close with you, we can reveal your characteristics and we can model your integrity and we can be your man. God, I pray in this hour, God, as we go from this place in just a little bit, I pray for divine opportunities to encounter people who need to hear the gospel, who are looking for the message of the cross to be shared. God, give us ready, willing hearts to speak truth and life in those situations. Help us to be sensitive to those appointments. And God, I pray that you'd help us to walk closely with you. God, that we'd just experience your glory in this place. And we'd experience your glory when we're out of this place. And we'd be living examples of the Christ life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 
Hey, Terry, is that holy ground? I thought so. You know the chorus, don't you, Marty? I bet you could lead that, can't you? Uh, do y'all know that one? We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Y'all know that one? Let us praise Jesus now, for we are standing in his presence on holy ground. Stand with me. Before we sing, let's do this. No, go ahead and stand. But before we sing, Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, I pray you be in your place for Sunday school and worship. Pray much for the worship time on Sunday. Pray for the mission team reports. Pray for a church to be inspired, to continue to invest in the lives of those who need the gospel here, across the street, and around the world. Amen? And let's do that. Let's look for a great day. Sing with Marty when you're ready. We are standing.